uh, it had to happen. <laughs> so I expect that when I give a talk in Chicago, but... Uh, oh, no. <laughs> that's just a different kind of food, I think, out there in Chicago. It's, it's not the same. So I, I, I've given a, a talk similar to this um, a couple of times before. The first time, it, um, it threatened to go on for about two hours, and I've, I've since learned how to be a little bit more efficient. I really will try to keep this about to an hour. Um, on the other hand, I think, it's, um, I think it's great for people to be able to ask questions. Uh, so please do, I need to get closer to the mic? Yeah. I will do my best. So please do stop me and ask questions, and I'll just try to do the best I can with, with the time that I have, and I'd be happy to speak with some of you later, but I will, ooh, it just became a 45 minute talk. So I will try to do what I'm going to do in about 45 minutes, and then if there's questions, I'll speak about whatever people would like me to speak about, or we can make it informal over drinks. Fair enough? So um, I'm going to cover a, a couple of things really superficially, because I expect a lot of you have seen some of this before, but I think it's helpful to set a context here um, before dealing with some of the more advanced topics. And the, the two main ones that I'd like to cover would be uh, Fast R Web, a package coming from uh, Simon Urbanic down at AT&T. And the other one being uh, R Studio's Shiny package. Um, but I'd just like to give you a little bit of context there, and this is probably a review for some of you. Um, but just for starters, let's say hello world a couple of different ways. And so this is a quick detour through maybe the history of the web. And I realize that um, a couple of us here saw the web evolve, but a lot of you were far too young to see the beginning. So um, maybe you'll learn something along the way. So I'm, I'm working here on a Mac, and I'll do something both here on the Mac and then log in remotely to a Linux server uh, back at Yale. Right now I'm just doing something locally here on, on this machine. I happen to have a web server installed. It might be Apache. The Mac puts things in funny places. I don't entirely approve of this, but we'll, we'll live with it. There's uh, two places here I want to I look at. I'll go into Documents first. And then in the Documents folder I have this um, little file hello.html. So if you've never seen raw HTML, it's the fundamental language of the web. And this is the sort of thing that you ought to do if you're writing HTML for the first time. So it says beginning of HTML page, end of HTML page, and in the middle you basically say hello to Newton. And so this file, if it's placed in just the right location, lets you um, open up a web browser and on that web browser here, I'm just going to localhost. This isn't actually live out on the web, but uh, you get the idea. And we can say, hello, Newton. Now, what's really happening here is that your web browser is sending a request to the web server that looks in just the right place. It finds just the right file. The information in that file is transmitted to your web browser, and your web browser knows how to render this HTML in sort of a user-friendly way. And that's all there is to it. And, and that's the basic building block beyond everything that we're going to do. Now you visit lots of web pages today and there's bells and whistles and things look fantastic, but fundamentally that's just juice on top of a very simple technology. So let's just deal with the simple stuff first and then maybe we can trust that you can figure out other stuff down the road. So an, a next step up from that is to um, get out of this documents folder and um, go into this folder CGI executables. On a Linux system that, was, that would be called the CGI bin. It's a different location for a different purpose, but the end result is going to be very similar. So I want to look at this um, foo.cgi thing. This is actually a Perl script. Um, you could do the same thing in different languages. You might use PHP. You might use Python. Um, Windows probably has something, but I don't know what it is and don't really care. You can see I have some certain biases, and I'm not shy about sharing them. So this little Perl script um, says, really, hello world. It's the same sort of thing, but you're actually looking at a script in a language. The language is Perl, and the Perl script is actually writing HTML. Um, this is essentially the same sort of HTML thing. I just haven't bolded the word um, world, say, or changed world to Newton. And so we can go through a very similar exercise here. So instead of looking at hello.html directly, I'm on my local host. I say I'm in. Uh, I want to go to CGI bin. I happen to know that there's this program here called foo.cgi, and I can run it in the browser. But before I do that, I'm going to go back here and type Perl foo.cgi. So from the command line, I can actually run this Perl script using the Perl interpreter, and all it does is print out 
the HTML code. And I'm saying code because uh, HTML stands for Hypertext Markup Language. So this document that you're seeing on the web is really the result of writing something like code following the rules of a language. You might not think of it like a language, but I think it's fair to call it one. So we're going to go back here now, and we have the CGI bin slash um, foo.cgi. And you get exactly the same thing. But what's happening now is a little bit different. You're sending a request to the web server. The web server receives the request. It's going now into the CGI bin. It's finding a script written in this language called Perl. It's running the Perl script, which is writing HTML code that's being sent to the browser and rendered in your browser. Now, that may be painfully obvious to half of you, and that's, that's fine if it is, but it's probably not obvious to a couple of you um, that being able to author code in one language by using another language um, is incredibly useful. It's a little bit of an abstraction, but trust me, it's extremely useful. And that one simple example is underneath almost everything else that we're going to talk about tonight. So I thought it was worth saying hello world in this really old-fashioned circa 1990-ish, I won't even say, technology. Okay? So we start out with HTML. We introduce CGI scripting. CGI scripting is behind a lot of um, forms, say, that you encounter on the web. You visit a web page. It says, uh, you know, type in this, type in that, maybe choose something. And it collects those results. It actually typically sends those results to a different CGI script that receives that information um, and does something fancy. And we'll actually see examples of that later on with more interesting examples. But this basic technology has been around for you know, probably more than 20 years at this point. I'm, I must apologize. I don't actually know what a fair starting date would be. But this is not new technology. And yet it's really the same sort of thing that we're going to be dealing with with the more advanced examples later. So let me pause there. Any questions? Yeah. What's CGI? CGI, a common gateway interface. Sorry. Good question. Others? OK. So let's move on. Um, I'm actually going to start with um, Simon Urbanek's package, Fast R Web. And uh, I'm going to start by saying, hello world, and then I'll give you a couple more interesting examples. And uh, if you'll bear with me for a second. Exactly the same example done in a different way. So look at this for a second. I assume everyone here is, is familiar with at least a little bit of R. So um, this is R code. This file contains the definition of a function. That function needs to be called run in lowercase letters. It can have arguments. This particular function just uses dot, dot, dot. Uh, the body of the function in this case contains um, two function calls. You're probably not familiar with either of them unless you've seen Simon's FastR web package before. So FastR web includes a very short list of functions that um, support everything that we're going to do. And done is probably fairly obvious. Out basically says, um, send this result out in a very specific way. And frankly, that specific way is compatible with HTML. Because everything that we're doing here, we're talking about delivering things on the web. So Simon is taking care of a lot of business for us. But what's interesting here is that just as with CGI scripting with Perl, we're now able to use CGI scripting with R, which is great for those of us who really like R and maybe have used Perl but would rather not. Or people who realize that you can do a lot of statistics and cool stuff in R that would be really tedious in Perl. Might be possible, but sort of painful in Python. You know, you can go down the list. Um, so that may or may not be true, depending on what you're trying to do in Python. But as a general rule, I think that you'll, you'll have more tools easily at your fingertips using R. So um, just as we did before, the script needs to be in just the right place. This is actually running off the web server up at Yale. Um, but if I uh, go over to my browser and go up to Euler.stat. Aha. 
Okay, it reloaded. That's really small, I apologize. But up in the URL, euler.stat.yale.edu is the server up at Yale. Slash CGI bin is the right place to put stuff like this. After the CGI bin, there's a capital R that looks like a folder. It's actually an executable provided by Simon that then processes everything following the R. So here's what's happening. Um, Apache knows that um, Simon has rserve and fastrweb installed on this particular computer. It receives a request. When it receives that request, it uses rserve and fastrweb to go off, look at that file. That file contains the function run. Needs to. It takes that function, it actually runs it, it does whatever is in the file, whatever is in that file is running our code that is then authoring HTML code that's sent to the browser and you just, your browser says, hello world. So exactly the same thing as happened previously using the Perl example, except now we're using the R language. Um, it's got configuration options, so you can tell FastRweb um, when it's launched initially on the server to load up certain, certain packages, so that when a visitor arrives at the site, R is already running in the background, it's already loaded those packages, and might already have done a little bit of work to prepare some data for, for some query that it might be expecting. So the, uh, the performance of FastR Web is really very impressive. There's not a whole lot of a lag between the time that the um, request hits the web server and the time that your result comes back to the user. Okay, so if you can say hello world, you can do almost anything. And by that, I really mean that that function, it's an R function. You can take everything that you know about R and put it in a function like that for a certain purpose. So let's take a small step forward. Instead of, instead of just saying hello world, whoops, that didn't work. Boiler.stat, yep, slash CGI bin, R main, I believe, example 1.png. OK, there's a plot. And I might even be able to say, uh, actually, I'm not sure if I can do that yet, so I'll stick with the plot. There's a plot. It's basically a plot of an R norm of something against an R norm of something, I think. I don't really remember. Maybe we should look at the file and find out. So if I look at, um, Example 1.png.r, again, a single function called run. Um, let's see, that's ju there's just a dot, dot, dot. So I thought there might be an argument passed to that function, and I was mistaken. I, I thought there was. Maybe that's example two. Um, again, there's a couple of new things here, but there's really not that much in FastR Web that you need to know about. Obviously, it's really handy to be able to send graphics out on the web. In order to be able to uh, render an R graphic on the web, you need to use FastR Web to declare that it's about to produce a plot. You use the function webplot to do that, then you do whatever R code you want to do to generate the plot, and then by just typing P, it's rendered here. I'm not quite sure why there isn't a done on the end. I don't know if that was um, my omission, or maybe that was an example that came from Simon's. Um, I don't see any reason we couldn't put done there. Um, but again, you know how to use R, you can take everything you know how to do, and then render the results on the web. So this is maybe example one of them. Um, you can see I've got a lot of examples of that, but um, I don't see example two. Yeah, that's too bad. Let's skip it and move on. We have a lot to cover. You've seen example one. I want to show you a more interesting example now and make an argument that you can really leverage this very simple technology to do quite a bit. A project I've been involved with over the last couple of years is the Environmental Performance Index. Um, it's a project that's um, that seeks any way to try to rank countries based on different aspects of their environmental performance. And so this is a website that was mostly produced by some professional graphics artists. Um, but underneath, we have something called a data explorer. We can go to, say, a table of main results. And here's the first example. When you visit this page, um, the nice graphics up at top, you know, that's, a, that's not me. I don't do stuff like that, right? I, I, couldn't produce something pretty like that if I, if I needed to. So you have a professional do something like that. And then on a web page like this, you basically have a big empty box. That big empty box, if you've done anything with web programming, is called an iframe. In that iframe, it's referencing 
a script that's on the server in the Department of Statistics in the same folder where we were just operating. So if someone visits this page, the iframe sends a query to the stat department server calling a script. It's a script that I wrote entirely in R that's probably using um, the Google Viz package to generate this table of results. The results um, are presented and immediately available to my script because the package is loaded up ahead of time at start time. If you haven't seen Google Viz before, it's really pretty cool. You can produce a table like this and just by clicking on the, uh, the column headers, it sorts interactively. So this is not a static table. This actually has a little bit of uh, interactivity that you, you may not have seen before. You can sort in reverse order. Um, I've also linked, say, the entries in the table to something called a country profile. And again, this is the same idea. When you visit this page, um, you can see up in the URL, there's actually an extra option here. So this is passing an argument to the CGI script saying, I want to know about the United States. So that argument is passed to my script. It's an R script. The R script takes the argument that says, I want to learn about the USA. And the script produces everything basically in the lower part of this table. This is using base um, grid graphics, a wonderful package from uh, Paul Morell down in New Zealand. Um, if you're designing your own customized displays, this is really the way to do it. Lots of standard displays. You can either use base graphics or something like ggplot. That's great. But you can't produce a plot like that um, using a standard plot command. You really have to go in and put every rectangle and every number in exactly the right place using exactly the right color shading. And all that code is inside a function called run sitting over there on the web server. And so everything that I did down below, which by the way includes some, uh, like a k-nearest neighbor calculation to identify countries with similar levels of performance, that the, that's the sort of thing you do in R. I want to do k-nearest neighbor in R. No problem. Boom. Got it. I want to do k-means clustering in R. It's ready to go. I want to do a linear model. That's fine. All that can be done so quickly and easily in R, and now all of that ability is at your fingertips just waiting to be rendered on the web when you get a request. So I realize the, um, that it's a little bit small, but part of this URL says um, probably country profiles. I happen to know that that's wrong, so let me just look at this. I would say um, cpmain.r sounds more like the script that's rendering this. There we go. It's a single R script. The R script contains a single function. That function has to be run in lowercase letters. You can see with this example, I now have some um, arguments to the function with default values. So if you visit this page, you're going to get Switzerland by default because they came out at the top of this, uh, this index. But if options are passed to this function, the options are processed below. I'm, I'm not going to really look at any of this code just to show you that everything here is R code. In fact, it's fairly standard R code. There's a lot of it. I don't even remember how many lines there are. Um, but this is all stuff that you can do if you work in R. All Simon is doing, all Simon is doing. Simon is doing wonderful things to then allow you to take everything that you already know how to do and deliver it on the web. There's some extras that you might need to know about. It's helpful to know something about cascading style sheets, CSS, just so the fonts maybe are consistent with the look and feel that you want on the site. Um, and you can go as deeply into that sort of thing as you want, and it's all, again, provided by the infrastructure here of Simon's, uh, Simon's package. Let me pause there. Questions on that? Yes? I have a question. Um, so on your, your server there, what, what did uh, what someone need to do to actually set up FastR Web to enable this sort of thing? Ah, that's a great question. Suppose you wanted to use FastR Web. I'm just curious. Mm, yep, right there. So it used to be around four or five. I guess it got bumped down to six or seven. I have a blog that I basically never use. But once in a while, I post things that might be useful. And one of the entries that I thought might be useful was a how-to about setting up FastR Web. Um, there's actually a set of steps that almost certainly will work on a, on a Linux box. It might actually be a little out of date. I think that he's improved his install script. 
um, so that if you actually go on his web, there's step-by-step -step instructions. It is a two-step process. You need to first of all have a machine running a web server that I think needs to be um, a Unix web server. I don't think he supports Windows. Um, you need to install rserve and then fastrweb, move something into just the right place where these instructions and probably Simon's will, will help you out. Um, it's, it's not really too bad. Yeah. Simon also took quite a bit of time thinking about some security concerns that people might reasonably have with CGI scripting. Um, and partly because he was doing this down for, for use at AT&T, and they actually care quite a bit about security. So, Yes? You use FastR Web as a compiler. So what you do is you uh, compile a, a static HTML web page, store it, and then redisplay it on a, on a server that does not have R running. Can you do that? I don't see any reason you would um, you would need to do that. No, because a lot of a lot of the commercial servers do not have R on them. Understood. You really can't run R on them. Right. But I'd like to be able to take some graphics. Yeah. Generate it on a server that does have R. Yeah. So I, I I've actually done that before. I just write the the R script to do that. Just offer an R script to produce an HTML page, and embedded in that page would be links to whatever graphics you want. You could probably do that. I use FastR Web as uh, as the methodology for me to generate that, as opposed to otherwise I'm just writing it in R code with no advantage at all of this superior package. You know, it, it might save you a little bit of time. I, I actually don't think it would save you as much time as you think it might save you. Um, you could do that, I believe, because everything that FastR Web generates um, produces a temporary copy in a directory that's called temp. And so you might be able to produce a series of queries uh, to the web pages that you want to generate and then pick them up in temp. Maybe it's a little bit of a hack. Again, I wouldn't be recommending that, but buyer beware. Yes? Just use the search. Yeah. Okay. That's true. I was going to say, you don't need to go through anything fast on web. Yeah. Right. Normal guy. In the back? Can you send data sets into the R program, or are you writing programs that largely manipulate the data set that's on the server already? Uh, I am working with data set that I have put on the server already. A convenient way to do that is just to dump your data sets into a package, and when you fire up our server and fast our web on the server, those are loaded automatically so they're ready to go in the session. Um, I'll tell you what, that's, it's, it's a great question because maybe it's a good segue to fast our web. Um, I won't show an example of this, but excuse me, a segue to Shiny. Um, Shiny actually has the ability to handle um, uploads and downloads quickly and easily that are probably better suited to that purpose. Um, I, I think if Simon were, were here, he'd say, oh, Shiny's pretty cool, but I can do everything Shiny can do within fast our web. Um, I think he's, he's probably either right or very close to being right, but from experience, I'd say that that's going to rely on your having a level of expertise that's probably unrealistic. It's certainly unrealistic for me. Um, I'm sure Simon can do it, but very few of us are, are as good at this sort of thing as Simon is. Um, and whereas Shine is really giving you the ability to do some things that are far more advanced without the same level of knowledge that would be required if you were using FastR Web. So um, the answer is I'm really glad that I have both tools. I'm a big fan of FastR Web, um, but Shiny is really cool, and a lot of things are much easier in Shiny than they would be in FastR Web. Other questions? I have questions here. Yes. Uh, have you heard of something called the R Notebook? The R Notebook. I have not. Uh, have you heard of something called the IPython? No. Okay. Uh, there's this thing in the Python world. Oh, here. Do <laughs> <laughs> you know what you're asking? Hello, please tell um, there's this thing in the iPython in, in the Python world that is the iPython network, which Python people generally know about. Basically, it's in, it, it's it's kind of like Python embedded in a mathematical web interface. So it's a um, it's an interface basically similar kinds of data exploration and, and visualization. Um, close that closely shadows the way the Python interpreter normally works. So. Um, 
um, I was literally just, I wasn't keeping tabs on, the, I had heard about a development in the R community for that, and I wasn't keeping close tabs on it. I literally just had it, someone do a search back there, and just in the past few weeks, apparently in October, there is an initial release of something called the R Notebook. So what I was gonna ask was, you know what the R Notebook and how it compares, but maybe we can just, you know, that's a tip for you, maybe the next time you give this talk. Yeah, yeah. Carlos Scheidinger from ATT Labs works with Simon. And is that renamed from the thing that you presented last year? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so you presented something similar last year here. I guess that's what it is. You called it R Cloud last year. You called it R Cloud last year. But something else had that name and it was hard to find. Right. So it's not the R Notebook. It's very different than what Jay is showing. It is more of like an end user. The R Notebook is that way you as an R program can go in there, write code, and get the result generated right on the page. You write more code, get the result generated. It is like that Python Notebook. Very different than the past R Web, but it's being created by the guy who sits next to Simon at NTT Labs, Carlos Scheidinger? Sure, what makes it? Carlos, are you here? No. Um, he did speak back in Octo uh, October of last year, I believe, sometime last year. There might be a video, there might be slides available from him. If not, it is really cool. It's not quite what the uh, Pi Python notebook is yet, but it's two weeks old, it will be getting there, I think. But it's something to look at. It's great having people in the audience who are willing and able to answer questions that I can't answer. So keep asking the questions and someone will know the answer. So let's switch now to, uh, to Shiny. Um, and I'm actually going to introduce this by, by talking a little bit about Shiny Helper, um, which I think is maybe an, an easier way to get into Shiny the very first time. Um, I've continued using it a little bit myself, but it, I think that maybe a couple of people have found that it, it's a useful way to get started and then after you sort of get it, you might not need to use it again. So I'm not sure where that places it on the list of, of, of things that are broadly useful, but um, take a look and, and, and at least it's up on GitHub, it's freely available. Most of the examples that I do are either included directly with Shiny Helper or are up on the web someplace. Um, so let me just go, go right into it. Um, Everything's up on GitHub. There's instructions for actually getting it. Um, there's a clever way to get it that makes use of dev tools. Um, but let's see. If I'm over here in R, I've got a script that I prepared. Is the font big enough in the back? Are we okay? Yeah. I'm going to load Shiny Helper. And let's say Hello World. I think that's really the right place to start once again. And so here's a little bit of code. It even fits on the screen. <coughs> so. Uh, how many of you heard of Package Skeleton? A couple hands. So if you're interested in writing your own R package, Package Skeleton is a great place to start. Start a fresh R session, create objects, functions, anything like that in the R section, in, in the R session, and then run Package Skeleton. It takes everything basically from your current session or a list of things that you want and puts them basically in a package for you along with um, some help pages, various things. There's probably cleverer ways to do it, but it's basically the, the right place to start by writing packages, I think. Um, and then you can edit those, those uh, files following the rules from uh, R core and, and CRAN, and you get an R package. So I created Shiny Skeleton as basically a way of giving you an empty Shiny app, and then we're going to add functionality to that Shiny app using functions that are merely convenience functions. So all I've really done here is, is create a set of, of functions such as header panel add. And so the dirty little secret is that there's a function called header panel inside of Shiny. And so I put the name add after it. And I'm writing the function for you, essentially. I'm writing a function call for you that's consistent with the syntax of Shiny. Slider input add. Slider input is actually something that you would need to make use of in Shiny. And I'm creating an extra level of abstraction here that is authoring Shiny code for you. So Shiny itself is written in R. So I'm writing R code, but I'm writing R code that's consistent with the design of Shiny. And as we look at this example, you'll see that although it looks like R code, and frankly it is R code, there's some oddities to the way, I think, um, a Shiny app looks like that, that makes it difficult to get into the very first time. After you're used to it, it's a different matter, but my hope is that this is a useful way to get you started. So as you, as you might guess here, slider input add is saying, I want to create this application, and on the application I want to have a slider and let people choose the sample size, 
It'll go from 100 to 500 with a default value of 100. And I'm going to associate with the number chosen by the user this um, letter N, this symbol N, which is then available to you as input dollar sign n. And so what you're doing here with plot output add is giving yourself a chance to write R code to do something that you'd like to do. And that R code here is just um, being presented as a string. And that code is being injected for you into the app in just the right way so that it provides interactivity between the slider and the plot that's being rendered. And so you don't have to worry about all of the things that you need to keep track of in Shiny to pull this off. Um, this sequence of commands right here is sufficient to create this Shiny app. So I'll copy and I guess I can just hit run. Okay. And run app hello Shiny. So I'm in my R session now. <coughs> in this particular example, I'm just running it locally on my computer. Um, but if you were actually running Shiny server on a web server someplace, this would be available over the web to someone who points their browser into in just the right location. So run app shiny, hello shiny is sufficient here. It automatically launches the browser. In the browser, you have a slider, and then to the right, you have a histogram of, in this case, 100 random normal observations. And if I change that 100 to 500, there's this immediate interactivity between the user input and the plot that's being rendered. It's basically rerunning the code, regenerating the plot, and rendering it in the browser. So it's not quite Hello World, but it's not too far beyond Hello World. Does that plot help PNG? Um, right click on PNG. Right click on PNG. It's an image. Yeah, sorry, I... <laughs> sorry, was there an option to... Uh, yeah, thanks. It's a PNG. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, let's look at what this app looks like. There's actually not a whole lot to it. So I am... Desktop, Dropbox, Talks, Intro, Shiny. OK. Um, when we ran that little block of code, and that little block of code is actually up on uh, GitHub. I didn't show you, but it actually created this thing right here, Hello Shiny, which is a folder. We go into the folder. There's two files, and every Shiny app has at least these two things, server.r and ui.r. UI is for user interface. Server is self-explanatory. If we look at um, UI.R, so here I'm requiring Shiny Helper just because there's some, some juice to some of the apps that I, I need extra functions uh, for. Shiny UI, this is the Shiny user interface construction. Um, the, the standard page that's in most of the examples you'll find is this thing called a page with a sidebar. So I have the sidebar on the left where there's user inputs. And then I have the area on the right where stuff is displayed broadly. I have a title, essentially. In the sidebar panel, right now, all I have is that single slider input. And you can see how everything there probably correspond, corresponds pretty directly to what you saw in the function call just a few minutes earlier. Scroll down to the main panel. The main panel is basically saying, uh-huh, there's going to be a plot. And the plot is my plot. And the dirty details about my plot are over in server.r. That's it. That's the end of this file. Now, you, you can see that this is R code, but there's something a little bit odd here. If you're used to doing data analysis, you're used to loading up uh, a data set and looking at the head of the data set, checking the dimension, maybe do a summary of some of the variables. This is a little bit odd. What do we have here? We're loading a package. And then that first line, that's a function call. OK. And then the first argument to this function call is another function call. And let's see, this page with sidebar function call, the first argument to that is a function call, header panel. And then see that comma. That comma is after the first argument to the function page with sidebar. The second argument, 
sidebar panel, that's another function call. And you, you look at this for a while, and then you look at server.r, and it's easy to lose track of um, whether you're writing R code that's actually part of a function call or whether you're writing R code that's actually R code that you're used to seeing if you're doing data analysis. So the first time that you look at some of these examples, it really is a little bit odd. Um, my hope is that um, by creating an app that's actually useful with very little pain with Shiny Helper, you then can look at an, at an example of working um, Shiny code and then modify it and learn more about Shiny on your own. That was my hope in any event. So let's uh, go look at server.r. Server.r is even shorter. Again, just requiring a package. Shiny server, again, that's a function call. Its first argument is, oh boy. Its first argument is not a function call. Well, it is a function call. But it's really defining a function. It's defining a function that has input and output. And then here's the body of the, the function. And the body of the function contains a funny assignment. We're assigning something to output my plot. Remember my plot? You saw it a second ago over in ui.r. That's the same my plot. We're using a function render plots provided by Shiny for, unsurprisingly, rendering a plot. And here's the code that you provided to me in Shiny Helper. So all Shiny Helper has really uh, done is insulate you from having to figure out exactly how to author this Shiny app in just the right way the first time. After you get the hang of it, you can probably do it on your own. So let's look at a more interesting example now. <clears throat> I'll zip back over here to my script. This demo is actually included with Shiny Helper. So if you get Shiny Helper from um, GitHub, you'll be able to do exactly this. Um, I'll do this one line at a time. Ooh, before I do that, you can see down in the console it says listening on port 8100. 8100 is the port that Shiny is using to do this, and it's still listening. So over in my browser, we still have that um, little histogram app running. And because that's running, my R console is frozen. So R is actually supporting that application right now, and I can't work interactively here in our studio. If I hit the stop button, it gets me out of that, and now I can proceed to the next app. So the demo is included with Shiny Helper. And let me make this bigger. Maybe hit return to start. Go ahead. So it, when you run this demo, you can go and look through this. You can see the example is a little bit more involved. Most of it you saw before. Now you can see that my plot is a much more involved plot. But the same um, ideas apply. I'm now going to be able to provide, say, a range of years. That information from the user will be available to me in input year range. Um, so there's a, just a few things that you need to know when you're writing your code, but most of this is standard base graphics stuff. And it produces the following app. So this again is based on that uh, EPI project that uh, I mentioned a second ago. I don't know why that didn't run. Run app EPI 2012. There we go. OK, very simple app. This is from the last uh, iteration of the EPI. We can uh, choose a country. And again, this is all interactive. So um, you choose a country, and all the data is immediately available. It's going through, and just based on inputs provided by the user, um, it's choosing to display different information as appropriate. So this is a time series plot. If I'm unhappy with the range of the plot, I can shorten the range. So here it starts at 2002. I can introduce some data from other countries for the purpose of making a, some sort of comparison that's interesting. So this is close to something that I'm actually using on a day-to-day -day basis with the EPI team. Um, I'm the only one who really writes R code in any serious way on the team. So I can put together a shiny app like this. I throw it up on the web. And they can quickly and easily start browsing the, you know, the current draft results of the EPI without needing to know anything about R. Um, it's limited to what I'm choosing to render to them in an app, um, but it really is miles ahead of what they'd be able to do on their own otherwise. So once again, let me pause there. Are there some questions about this example? Yes? What would an equivalent uh, look like in fast R I mean, uh, Yeah. I mean, the that you showed, like the slider primitive, um, you know, 
that's already right. part of the shiny package. So shiny is providing that slider. Um, let's start with a, a, let's just talk about a simpler example, a dropdown. So if you know a little bit about basic HTML, um, HTML provides a support for forms. A form is basically um, a URL to a CGI script. Um, and then information, in this case, country names, and maybe values associated with those country names, are actually in the HTML code in a very specific format. So if you know a little bit about HTML, you could actually author the HTML code yourself to produce a dropdown. And I actually did that in the, um, in the EPI project using FastR Web. So I authored the correct HTML code to render a dropdown associated with that dropdown in a form, another FastR Web script that would receive the information and, um, and generate the output properly. So you could actually do that dropdown in FastR Web. It would be like reloading a page, and on that new page, you'd see the new plot. It wouldn't be quite as seamless as this, um, and a lot more work. It would actually force you to know a little bit more about HTML forms. Good question. Others? Yes? If you didn't have a web page where you want to set up something like this in a like a GitHub file, that would be possible. Uh, right? I, I don't think so because you'd have to have a way of, of having a um, Chinese server running up on GitHub and you really doubt that's going to work. Doesn't Revolution provide Revolution has something maybe called Glimmer? Is that right? That's our studio. All right, our studio. Excuse me. Uh, did you ask about Revolution? I feel like I've seen some shiny hooks in the Our studio, yes. Just they do if you're an academic and I'm going to use it for free. If not, I think they're still working on a business model for um, what they're going to charge for versus what they're going to provide for maybe developers. No idea. I'll ask JJ the next time I see it. It's a free business. So free. The premium. There could be free for people like you, expensive for other people. <laughs> other questions? Let me oh, yes. When is it when is uh, the data getting loaded from and is it accessible to uh, a different user? Ah. So yeah, that's a good good question. Um if I go back into uh, our studio, uh, I'm really not very good with this. In fact, I didn't even want to be there. There's the code for the plot, and then right there, there's a there's a function that I wrote called inject data. So when you're writing an app and you want a certain data object to be available to the app, um, it's a little bit of a kludge, but I, that's part of what Shiny Helper is doing for you. Um, it's giving you a mechanism for um, making data objects available to the app, and my short name for that was Inject Data. Um, if you want to see what Inject Data actually does, you could go look at the app that's produced and look at the shiny code that obviously has to do with that object so you have a sense of, of what's going on. Um, we could do that very quickly. If I go back and go into, let's see, EPI 2012 is the, um, the folder that was just created. If we, You can see that x.r data. I put that in the right place. And then if we look in, say, um, server.r, I'm just loading that up front. Um, and then I can actually make use of it um, down here and doing the plot, you can see, for instance, right there, x dollar sign ISO. Um, so that's coming from the object x. So that's one of the things that um, Shiny Helper is doing for you, so you don't need to figure out, out how to do it the first time. Good. Other questions? Let me zip back into here, take a quick look. OK, as I said. Still running, I have to stop it. So this is an app, again, um, a basic version of this app was produced um, using Shiny Helper. And so that basically did the job, but Shiny has a feature um, to provide conditional 
user input. And by conditional user input, I mean that the user might be faced with some options over here. In this case, select plot type United States or select individual states. This is an example of a conditional user input where if you go down and select individual states, the user is then presented with a different set of options to choose from. Seems like a very simple thing, something that obviously you'd want to do. Um, and it's not that hard using Shiny. Um, and I just wanted to have one example of, of doing that. So we, by default, are focusing on Connecticut. But again, the same principle applies as you go through and the user provides different types of input. The, um, the plot is immediately responding. So once again, you have this interplay between whatever the user is providing for the input and the resulting plot. This is just using the uh, maps package. I put this together because I had to give a talk at the Census Bureau, and I figured I'd better use their data. OK. So we're pretty close to 8 right now. So I think what I'd like to do is um, leave it right there for now. Uh, you want me to talk a little bit more? I actually prefer to open to questions right now, and if there really aren't any, I probably have. I actually, I do have one more, more example I'd like to do, but a question in the back. Do you have any examples of accepting user posted data? The question someone has asked before is it shiny user posted Yeah, good, good question. In fact, I have two things I want to show you, and um, <laughs> the one that I forgot relates exactly to that question. Um, so if you're writing down URLs, and I apologize, this is small, but. Um, www.stat.yale.edu slash tilde j, j -A -Y, which you have to spell properly. I'm getting old. J. OK. So there's my uh, home page. I'm easy to Google. If you take that URL and on the end add capital EC2, EC is probably for. Is it Elastic Cloud? This is, yeah, so whatever it is. The, the Amazon thingy that's sort of cool. Um, we, we put some instructions up here on what you would actually have to do to create a node up on the Amazon Cloud. And then you want to be able to install R. You want to be able to install FastRWeb. And you want to be able to install a web server, obviously, and Shiny Server. So if you're really interested in this, you probably want to know about this. Um, because this is a set of scripts that will do all of that for you so you don't have to figure it out. And if you can do it up on Amazon, you can probably figure out how to do it on your own web server. Now, the reason I needed to do that, obviously I wanted you to know about it, but I needed to grab this URL right here because it's not something anyone would remember. And so we're visiting my node up on the Amazon server. And I happen to remember that um, 3838 is the port that's used by Shiny. And so on port 3838 of this obscure little dinky box running up on Amazon's EC2, um, we have a couple of examples that you've seen some of these already. Um, but you also have a folder called examples. In that folder of examples is the set of examples that's provided by the Shiny folks to do a great list of basic things that almost everyone would want to do with the Shiny app, and I believe one of those is upload, and one of them is download. And so although I have not written a Shiny app to do that, and I'm not supporting that currently in Shiny Helper, it wouldn't be that hard to add that functionality in. But in terms of what you're asking, I'd say that the thing to do is to get used to Shiny with some basic examples, and then when you want to learn about, say, Shiny upload, um, Go here, and here's an example of a Shiny app that supports that upload. And the code to do this is up on, uh, I'm pretty sure it's up on GitHub from uh, our studio. So I didn't quite show you how to do it, but that's how you would find out how to do it. And I'll want to do it myself fairly soon. So. Other questions? I'm sorry, take down the which code? The timer. Timer code. Example number 11, timer. Ah, OK. How many people run it? Right. Your server will die. <laughs> yeah, so my server is about to expire anyway. I got sort of a year of this instance running up there. And so eh, it's, you can just turn it off. It's no big deal. This is a good place to play with things so you don't do something that you don't want to on your, your production box. Yes? So you've shown some examples that you said are like pretty basic. Can you show us something that's really cool 
Yep. Let me show you something oh, that I did. No, I can't show you that. There you go. Let me show you that. That's a great request. Um, other. Shiny leaflet. So this is not my example, which is probably why it's really cool. Um, browser. So uh, this is Joe Cheng basically wrote Shiny, so he's the guy. This example is up on the web, and there's probably a link. Um, there's the other thing you had was a link to it. Oh, did I have that here? Oh, yeah, good. Thank you. Glimmer. <clears throat> okay. Now I always have trouble when I do this demo um, running my own computer. And maybe you'll see why in a second. Um, this is a really cool example, I think. Um, you actually have some interactivity with the plot up top. We'll be able to zoom in, we'll be able to zoom out. As you're zooming in and out, and this is um, powered by Leaflet with Maps by Mapbox. That means anything to anyone, that's how we're doing it. As you zoom in and out or recenter in the plot at the top, it keeps track of the latitude and longitude of the, um, of the map that's being displayed. And it keeps track of the center of the map. Passes that information down below. So this is actually a form of user input. You have interactivity with the plot up at the top, and that's just another form of user input, much like choosing a year or choosing something here. So now we have user input down here. We have user input up there. And that's also a display. And we've got plots that update based on what part of the country you're looking at. So now let me ruin it all by messing up the demonstration. But in theory, that's what you're supposed to be able to do. So I'll try the simple one first. I'll zoom in. There we go. So as I zoom in, you can see there's very faint, you can't see, but there are very faint green circles up in the top that are the cities that are identified. Um, if we go down here in the bottom, um, it says the map is centered at, and it gives you those coordinates. And it says the top 100 out of 7,830 uh, visible cities are being displayed. Visible cities appear in this list down below, total population of visible cities. So everything down here is, has adapted to uh, the particular zoom <coughs> that you've uh, achieved up on the top. And so we can drag this over, and as you drag that, the information down below is being updated. Okay, so that's, I don't know if it's a whole lot cooler, but it certainly is a whole lot more professional than my examples. Is that okay? Yeah. Um, and so you probably saw a second ago, I was actually at Joe's GitHub site that has this example on it, so you can download all this code. Um, I've gotten it to run on my laptop. I've never spent a whole lot of time actually looking at the code behind the scenes to see how he integrated it with Leaflet and Mapbox, but it's all open source, it's all out there. Other questions? I think I almost did it. 45 minutes? Pretty close. I think that's it then. I'd be happy to talk to anyone afterwards if you have specific questions about anything. Uh, I have one question about the master's program that maybe yeah, happy to talk about that. Um, fantasy football, I can talk about that. Okay, thank you all for coming. Good to be here.